I thank you for the gift of knowledge. And I praise you that you have provided us with brains to think and question the world around us. I pray that you would help our children and young people to learn well and flourish. And may they discover their unique gifts and talents and give them a passion for the world around them, but also a passion for you. Father God, I thank you that you made us to be in relationship with others. And I pray that our children and young people will feel the love and care and support from church members. And may they in turn encourage their friends, sharing in some way your love and care for us. We love you so much, Lord, and we reset, surrender fully to you today. And we pray that your love will guide us today and every day. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Karen said, building a program is what we're going to be looking at. And as she has so said yesterday evening, this is something you will see again and again. Uh, uh, every Sabbath is an opportunity to win the hearts of your children and teens for Jesus or an experience that will turn them away from Jesus. You know, if you think about this and you were to think about every Sabbath in this way, I'm sure all of us would love to choose the first one and not the second one because experiences are just so important. You know, I, I just want to share a story here about um, uh, our church, the first church my husband and I were working at. It was a small church with lots of old members and we had five children in that church. Two of them were ours. But after every service, a lady called Mrs. Oranya, would stand at the door and she would have sweets for the children and she called them Sabbath sweets. And she discovered that my eldest son is not really into sweets, but he did like honey. So she bought special honey sweets for my son. And none of the children were allowed to have them. They were only for Dexter. Well, unbeknownst to me, years later, we'd moved on. We had different jobs in the church and so on. And then we lived very close to the old people's home. And by now, Mrs. Oranya was in the old people's home. And unbeknownst to me, my son had been visiting her because he said later, you know, Mum, she was always so nice to me. We have an opportunity to reach the hearts of our children, even with small things like giving sweets. If we could do that, we would be giving them experience for life, and that is very important. Now, how often should we have intergenerational worship? Well, every service needs to involve someone from each age group where possible because each age group will bring something to the mix. Try to involve children and teens in the service even if it is not a full intergenerational service, especially in the scripture reading or in some part of the sermon and illustration, etc. You know, sometimes we wait so long before we start involving our children that they get to the age where they don't want to do anything anymore. Whereas if they're used to doing it, they will continue to do it. We need to be more proactive in how we involve our young people and children. Many churches will have a full intergenerational service monthly and starting slowly, probably once a quarter would be a good thing, getting people used to the idea and then maybe moving to once a month and so on. It's, uh, it, it's better to start slowly than to start really wildly and everybody gets upset. So I think once a quarter is a good way to go. And then who should organise the intergenerational service? Well, we need to recruit and train a special team, including creative people of all ages, and give each team member a special task suited to their gifts, the songs, the scripture, the prayer, the sermon, etc., and include people of all ages and don't forget the singles. You know, when I read this and was asked to present this part, I had to think of something which happened to me because it says here, including creative people and giving them a task that is suited to their gift. I had a friend in the Netherlands. Uh, I mean, she wasn't my best friend, but I knew her quite well. Her name was Erica. 
And uh, I thought I knew her quite well, but I had to find somebody to make a suit for me that fitted with a puppet's head because ordinary clothes was too small. And someone said, oh, Erica can sew. So I made an appointment, went to her house, and I said, I didn't know you could sew. And she said, oh, yes, I've been sewing for years. She said, you know, when I was 19, somebody gave my name for a regional competition and I won. And then I was sent to the national competition and I won. And I was sent to Italy and I came third in Europe. And I was just shocked because I had known her for years and didn't know any of this. Sometimes we can know people, but we don't actually know them, their gifts, their talents. We need to find out what it is that these people have to offer. Did you know? <laughs> well, you don't. Well, I didn't either. But she sewed all the clothes for one of the Dutch princesses. So she was really very good. These are the talented people that we can use if we only knew what the gifts and talents are of our children, of our members, of our older members. Now, in one church... Each month, the intergenerational service was taken by a different family. This is something that uh, Karen told us yesterday evening. So each family only needs to lead out about once a year. I like that idea a lot. And the families also invite people from other generations because there are single people in church, older people who come on their own. They need to be incorporated in one of the families to help them plan and lead out. And this provides more opportunities for intergenerational relationships and community. Now, who should organize the intergenerational service? Now, in some churches, the children's ministry and youth teams work together to plan the service. Working together is always a good thing because you incorporate more ideas, more people who are coming maybe from different directions. Now, in one country, Pastors were trained in intergenerational worship, and each pastor would write out the planning details for the service, and those were shared on a website, and churches could use the ones that suited them. And this same time for everybody. You know, this is a big thing in our church. We're all doing the same thing. No one shares, and we're all doing, doing the same program, but doing having all the stress that goes with it. If we were willing to share we could perhaps help each other out. Even when things are not going to plan, we can reach out and take somebody else's uh, program. So think about that when you're doing things. Now, this is just a simple little graph of what you could do to start out. Number one, consider working with a series of ideas so that you don't spend a long time thinking about the topic. It could be the parables, could be the Sermon on the Mount, it could be the Lord's Prayer, it could be the days of creation, uh, the Ten Commandments. Just think about it. If you have that already in place, it takes away a lot of talking and a lot of planning because you already know which direction you're going. This, I think, is so important. Number two, prayerfully study the topic passage together and reflect on it. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. This is not something we're doing for ourselves. We're doing it together with the Holy Spirit and with God. So let him speak to you when you are deciding on what you want to do. This is a very important step. And explore it creatively. Apply the lessons to the lives of children and young people today, as well as older generations. You know, quite often we have Bible stories and we talk about it. And then a lot of the times people think, yeah, but that was then. We need to find the lessons that apply today because the Bible is relevant today as well. We need to be creative in bringing those lessons out and sharing them with the young people and the children and older people for that matter so that they can see that it is relevant. And then experience the story through different senses to give you fresh ideas. You know, we're all made with our senses. We smell and we taste and we touch and we hear and we see. And all of these senses bring things into us. You know, I remember uh, I went on a holiday 
years ago because we haven't been able to leave the country for so long. And we went to Rhodes Island and we had rented a car. And in the middle of Rhodes Island, there was a pine forest. And the smell of pine was just everywhere. And it took me back because I grew up in Australia and my grandmother passed away in Australia. And we buried her in a graveyard, which was in a pine forest. And all of a sudden, I, I was back there. You know, there was one pastor who had done something that I will never forget. He took the story of Jacob and Esau. And what he did was in that story, he stood in front of the church and he started making lentil soup. The smell was just amazing. And no one ever forgot that sermon. That was just using the senses. We saw it. We smelt it. We later tasted it. It was just absolutely amazing. So think about these four steps because they are so important when we are taking up the opportunity to do an intergenerational worship. So as you mentioned yesterday, it's really important to involve children and teens in the church service. This is what we're learning about this whole weekend, really. And we spoke yesterday about using their gifts and talents whenever possible. And as Claire shared, we need to know people. We need to know the children and young people in our churches, talk to them, find out from them what excites them, what their skills are, what they love to do. And someone asked yesterday about what to do with a reluctant child. Well, the important thing is they want to come to church and they love it. If we're making them do something they don't want to do, if we're forcing them to recite Bible verses, when actually for some children, memorization is incredibly difficult and they are so afraid that they will, be, they will forget something and be shamed. We must be super careful not to let children experience shame when they're involved in the service. It can be really frightening to them. and They can feel like they don't want to come back to church. They feel everyone is laughing at them. So make sure whatever they do, they are comfortable with it. They enjoy it. They see that they give a blessing to other people. The quieter ones who might not be so upfront, they can be involved behind the scenes and let them do that. They can write ideas for others to read. They can write a prayer. Someone else can say it. You could get people of different ages to choose a song and the shy ones can write down and why they chose it for someone else to read. We'll take a little video of them at home so they can be sure this is the video they want people to see. So make it safe. And they can do artwork or make videos or go and take photographs of something which can be involved in the PowerPoint. So if you're doing a service about say trees, I don't know, something around that children could see in their everyday life, get them to take a photo, send it to you, use their photos in your PowerPoint, and they will be excited about that. Let's be creative about all the ways we can involve them. There was one church where during the Sabbath school, the children made badges for everyone in the church that said, I am a beloved child of God. And the children, uh, th these words were printed on the badges and the children could decorate them in all sorts of different ways. When they went into church in the service and there was the welcome time, these children went round and gave a badge to every person in that church. And there were some old people who were moved to tears. They had never realized they were also a beloved child of God. Children can also write out a favorite Bible verse, decorate a postcard, write a prayer and decorate it and give it to someone else in the church, an older person. And in this quiet way, they can actually inspire the older people and, and show that they care for them and maybe build a little gentle relationship with them. In my church, um, all the young children had an adoptive safe grandparent in the church who would talk to them after church every week. The child would take or do something to bless the older person. The older person would try and do something to bless the younger person. And they made some very special relationships there. That was so important. Now, we often have children and teens to um, read the scripture reading. And all too often, they are handed the scripture reading um, on Sabbath morning. They haven't read it before. 
Um, it might be in the King James Version or an older version of the Bible, but they really don't understand. It's not easy to read if you're not familiar with um, the way the words flow in the New King and the King James Version. Sometimes there are really difficult names to say that even I struggle to say, like Mephibosheth or something like that. And they haven't seen it before. And when we give them the words and they haven't practiced, it can be frightening for them and they can feel really awkward. So I heard about a church doing the scripture reading in this way, and I thought it was amazing. So they plan a month ahead, at least a month ahead, what the scripture reading is going to be. Then they mentor the child or teen um, into doing that scripture reading. So the mentor is trained and they're a safe person. It can be the parent even, or the pastor or the youth leader or someone else. And they meet with that child and say, let's meet after church and look at the Bible verses that you are going to read in a month's time. Let's talk about them together. Maybe we can have an email chat or a WhatsApp chat and share what these words mean to you. So maybe the mentor meets first and they read it and says to the child, do you have any questions? Do you understand this? Tell me what it means to you in your words. And that way you can check whether the child really understands what they're reading. And once they understand and they think about it and they pray about it, ask them to help you think of their own creative way to present these verses. Maybe they want to dress up. Maybe they, they want to set it to music or play some music in the background. Maybe they want to find a piece of art to show while they uh, are reading the scripture reading or several pictures in a PowerPoint or some objects they want to show to make the point come alive, maybe even a video clip. So help them think, um, whether they're a small child, a teenager, a young person, how will they do this? And maybe consider mentoring the adults to do more interesting scripture readings too. I heard a lovely story about this. A young boy was asked to read something from Isaiah and um, it was um, like a poetry part in Isaiah, not a very commonly read piece of scripture. And he met with a mentor and they read this through. And as the child was reading, he said, oh my, I will be reading the words of God. It was like, and the Lord God said, you know, and then there were these wonderful words. And the child said, I, when I speak these words, these are the words of God. And he had never realized before that there were words in the Bible that were words of God. Of course, they knew that, but for some reason this became more apparent to him. He said, I'm, I need to be God. When I, when I do this, I need to kind of look like God. So this wasn't an Adventist child. And he said, I think I need to like wear all these chains and gold and look really wealthy. And, you know, um, that was his picture of God. Anyway, the mentor thought, well, we'll just let that one sit for a bit and uh, see what happens. They didn't say, no, you can't do that or anything like that. They said, let, let's just think a little bit more about this and let's pray about it and see, see what God is telling you about how to present this. And then as the child read on further, and uh, it ended with something like, I am your creator, God, the God who made heaven and earth. And he said, that's it. I'm speaking the words of the creator God. I know what I'm going to do. And he went home and he got his mother to get a, a, like a green velvet jacket from a charity shop and to stitch on it flowers and make a crown for his head with the stars and the moon and, and little animals on his clothes, all sorts of things that represented um, things that God had made. And so when he read the scripture reading, it meant so much more to him because he'd thought about it. He'd got his mom to make this coat to wear. And he said, this morning, I am going to read to you the words of the creator God. And this is why I look like this, because I want to remind you that God is the creator who made all of these things. And this is the God who is speaking the words to us that I will read today. How powerful is that? It's powerful for the child. It's powerful for the mentor. It's powerful for the whole church when we involve children in really meaningfully um, reading the scripture reading, mentoring them into this creative process so that their ideas are there and that it goes deeper into their heart. It's a deeply spiritual moment that child has 
just in exploring the scripture reading in advance. And when we don't do this, we are missing amazing opportunities to mentor them and to nurture them. So we need to involve children and teens in prayer in, in, this, in the services. And it's quite easy to do this. In one church, people put their hands up if they have a special prayer request. And the children are taught from quite a young age to go amongst the congregation, find those people with their hands up, quietly ask them, what can I pray for you today? And then pray one or two sentences of prayer for that person, an old person, a young person, whoever it is. They don't pray them aloud so everyone can hear. They just pray quietly for that one person at a certain time in the service. One idea that we have used is uh, called the prayer bag idea. So we have four bags and maybe you have a pink bag that's praise, uh, a yellow bag that's thanks, a blue bag that's sorry, and a green bag that's please. And you give everybody four pieces of paper in those colors, pink, green, yellow, and blue. And they know that what they write on the pink paper is praise and so on. So the people just write a short sentence or maybe children will draw a picture, what they want to praise God for this week, what they want to thank him for, what they're sorry for and what they want to ask him. And then the children gather all these papers up and because they're color coded, even small children can go and gather the papers, put everything in the right bag. And then what we do is we pick up one bag in turn and we say, Father God, this is all our praise this morning, this and so much more. And here are a few of the praise things that are written in this bag. You know all the words that are in here already, but here are some praises we want to speak out loud to you. And then we go to the thanks bag and do something similar and sorry and please. Then afterwards, we, we destroy all the sorry ones because sometimes children put things in there that are a bit personal. Um, but we put make a big poster of the praise words, of the thanks words, and of the prayer requests and put them in the church so people can add to them or read them and um, that the prayer lingers longer. You can even ask children to or anyone to bring, what are you thankful for? Can you bring something small that illustrates what you're most thankful for this week? or what reminds you of your relationship with God and God's love, whatever. You can have a different topic. People can bring things to display. And maybe you ask one or two people to say, um, tell me why you chose this. And so the children are thinking through the week what they can bring. You can ask a group of teens to create a prayer together. You can even pray with a PowerPoint to make it interesting. There are lots of ideas in my book, 100 Creative Prayer Activities for Kids and Grown-Ups Too. So, and we put lots of prayer ideas in the resource Dropbox that you can access and um, that were done for all ages. So some of those might be suitable in church to involve people more in this act of prayer, which is so important for us. Something else we've done with children and which you might like to do at, at some point with your family is go through the alphabet together, praising God, using adjectives that describe him and his different names, such as almighty, alpha, amazing, um, blessed, bountiful, beautiful, Christ, caring, creative, deliverer, El Shaddai, eternal, etc. Um, and if we had more time, we'd be doing this live and we'd be calling them out as we go through the, um, the program. But it's a useful thing to do for yourself or with your family. Write an alphabet down. See how many adjectives you have to describe God. The God who smiles on you. The God who sings songs over you. Um, we did this with children once. And in 10 minutes, these children had come up with 210 names or adjectives to describe God um, together and it was absolutely incredible they came up with things that most of us would never have thought about because they think about God in such simple and creative and inspiring ways so this you can do in different ways in a church service as well so as we said yesterday if you if you want your church to be younger and younger to grow younger to have more young people more children uh, we should prioritize young people everywhere. And what we are talking exactly here is this everywhere, every aspect of worship 
and every aspect of church life and every aspect of anything else that we are doing as a church and even individually to prioritize them, to make this appropriate for their age. So when they listen, they when they see something, it's it's appropriate for their age and for their, their style to involve them, to participate and to ask them to contribute. So whatever we are talking, we are talking about these principles. And now just some examples how we can do this with music and with songs. One idea is just to include at least one children's song or one contemporary song per service. We can have a mixture of one children's song, one contemporary song, and one uh, traditional hymn uh, song from the older age in the same worship. Just to have this is very, very, uh, uh, very nice. Uh, one idea related to that is we can have, uh, we can have uh, on the same topic, two songs on the same topic from different age. So for example, if we are talking about grace, we can take one reformation song or one a song from 19th century or early 20th century, and then we can have something for children or very contemporary song on the same topic. Uh, second is invite be people of all ages to choose some uh, hymns and songs and introduce them and say why they have chosen these uh, the, the songs. So we can just invite them to choose songs. Uh, and it's, it's nice in intergenerational worship to invite people from different ages to do that. Um, if we can, I would say, we can include a teen or a child or people who are usually not included in a worship planning team. So don't just, um, you know, it, it can be a mistake now we as elders, adults, or oh, we want intergenerational worship. Now we meet and we plan. The best way is to include different generations in choosing uh, the songs and hymns and designing any other part. And just by including them, it will affect the choice of songs and hymns. Um, may maybe you can choose a song that all generations know and enjoy. So it can be a song that all generations know and enjoy. And then you can ask people from different generations to reflect what does this song mean for them. You can ask this in advance so that people can be ready. You can say, oh, this song we know uh, people of different generations likes. And then you can just ask them to uh, ask two people from different ages to say why you like this song, what you like with this song, what does this song means to you? And uh, just by a reflection, we include them in songs. Uh, let them play their own instruments. I can tell you when I was a child, I would have mandolin, uh, playing, I would somebody else would play something else. In some churches, we have uh, we have uh, all these uh, uh, rhythm instruments that uh, children, uh, especially, can get during the song, and they can make a noise, uh, praising uh, God and being involved in such a way. There are different ways how we can involve them in singing. We can make a band uh, for young people. That's very important that they are part of the uh, worship team, of those who are singing and those who are uh, playing the instruments. Uh, invite them to illustrate songs and hymns with their own pictures, videos, or PowerPoint presentation. Uh, all this needs planning, as you can see. But you, uh, th there are so many things. Sometimes we adults spend time in creating PowerPoint presentations and other things. We can just ask. Uh, children and young people to do that for us and then we will immediately have a different style because they will do it according to their style. So there are different ways how they can do. I can say now during the Zoom time, many of these things can happen, maybe not in the same way as on, in physical worship, but uh, recording in advance. Some, some kids will be good to be in front of camera. Some kids will be good or young people to, uh, to work with camera and to edit, with the edit. I think we should use that even after, uh, after lockdown is finished. When we are back, we can in advance create many songs and show as video clips during the worship of our people. Uh, it can be uh, anything, songs and other parts. And involvement is, even if we don't see people on the stage, 
or in the video. Involvement is if they're editing that, taking pictures, taking videos, uh, creating things. So this is also for different people uh, with different gifts. The second and the next one is how to involve them in the offering. Uh, there are many different ways uh, you can find in the book by Karen, uh, different ways. One thing is children can decorate tight and offering envelopes or anybody in the church can. You, you can just give a white blank, uh, blank uh, 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 envelope and it can be instead of, you know, sometimes we have just a reading of the Bible verse as introduction to offering. Why not to have something visual? Give envelope and ask people in five minutes that they can decorate, write something, uh, write on the slip of paper, thank you. And all generations can do that. And children especially will like that they can decorate tight and the uh, offering envelope during the worship. But you can ask them to do this as a special activity. And then you can uh, give this tight and offering envelopes at later stage. Uh, individually decorated by younger generations or anybody who likes that. Uh, they can collect small coin coins towards their own service project. Uh, so you, you can have separate offering uh, for their own service projects or any other church project uh, where children can uh, collect. Generally, children can collect offering. That's also one way of being involved. Uh, teens can create a short creative video or sketch about giving uh, or how the offering is used. And th this is especially now because we are thinking how to involve uh, in Zoom uh, online people in offering because we don't even collect offering at that moment. Uh, but to create a short creative video, uh, sketch about giving uh, can be used now online and also later in, in live or pre-recorded. Um, we can also ask them to, uh, to represent how the offering is used, as we said. Then, involving children and teens in the sermon. Again, every part of the worship, we need to involve children and teens. And young people, generally, we sometimes think they don't appreciate sermon. They don't think sermon is important. But many studies are showing that, uh, that the sermons are very, very important, that the teaching and sermons, how engaging this is, uh, uh, will very, uh, have strong influence on their future acceptance of the church and, of gen uh, and generally, uh, and generally uh, Jesus. So invite children and teens to participate in sermon. Just invite them, talk to them uh, in a way find the ways to, uh, to invite them to participate in the sermon. Um, and I'm uh, telling this and preaching this to me my, uh, first. Use the five senses. I'm one of these theologians who like only one way, or one sense and one way of uh, learning. And then I have missed often using this in sermons. But we can use uh, all five sens senses in sermon by, in different ways. Um, it can be a vis visual illustration. It can be active illustration. We can invite young people to come and uh, children to come and show them something by action and involve them in action uh, and by involving them to do something that will be good illustration for the point that we want to make. We can hide pictures or objects in PowerPoint slides, uh, things for children to find. So as we are having a PowerPoint slide on the sermon, we can have some pictures that they need to find. We can, uh, they can count how many they have found. And these pictures, that these objects can be connected to the topic. Um, we can uh, ask teens to be involved in different ways, in creating or finding videos for us, in creating dramas, sketches, uh, stories, acting, mind, whatever it's uh, visual and acting, they like it. And, what, uh, and we can include them not only that we create for them, we can ask them to create for us. We can talk to them about the sermon that we want to have and then to, to ask them to give their contribution. We can give children, we can prepare and give children activity sheets. So the sermon um, can have activity sheet connected with what you want to say and what children can do and write and read and draw and paint uh, color uh, du during the sermon. 
uh, I would like to say to those of you who are preparing sermons, maybe you feel, oh, I don't know to do all of this. Ask people in the church who are good in that to do something for you. If you prepare in advance, if you prepare your sermon in advance and you say, uh, I will be preaching on this and this text. Can you prepare activity sheet for me? Can you prepare a video or drama or something like this? It needs a teamwork not individual preparation and everything coming to one person. And also, if you see that your pastor or your preachers are not using all of these things, come kindly to them, encourage them. Many of them likes children and kids. Offer help to them that you can prepare something for them uh, and, and, and in that way encourage them uh, that they become involved uh, for all generations. Um, you, you can do creativity, play the uh, or arts, uh, give them uh, play daft so that they can create something related to the sermon. Um, th then you can um, uh, invite them to model something and uh, later you can display the models after the service. You can even ask a teacher or scientist to be involved, to involve the children in a science or nature experiment and as an illustration during the sermon time. So ask other people. And we are coming also to creativity, to art. Invite children and teens to illustrate the Bible verses in the scripture reading with pictures, then incorporate them into the PowerPoint. There are so many things and this can be done uh, to, through Zoom. And I, I see that many churches are already doing this, asking children, asking young people to illustrate. That can be also some kind of drawing videos. You know, these videos where you see somebody is drawing, there are young people, and not only young people, so well, uh, so uh, with so good gifts that they can illustrate things in this drawing with us. Help them to learn how to make drawing with us. Maybe those who are good in recording can record those who are good with, in drawing. And uh, they can work together in creating illustrations and drawings and messages in such a way. So that's excellent way to use them and use especially uh, teens and young people uh, in that. Also, children and teens can design bulletin covers and banners. If you're using bulletin covers, banners, you can ask them in advance, especially if you have a topic to design to make something. Uh, other creative members, older, can mentor the younger ones and vice versa. We can have a reverse mentoring and somebody mentioned. Uh, you have young people who are creative in different ways. They can mentor uh, others and I should need mentoring in that area uh, and uh, why not? Uh, we can ask, uh, we, we can make uh, related to creativity. We, we, we can have some kind of intergenerational art event. We can have a worship where in advance um, you choose the topic and you ask all generations to create, uh, to prepare drawings, paintings and other artistic creation. And you can during the worship share this and have a short message related to that, uh, but different generations can be involved in such a way. So these are everywhere, wherever, in whichever part of the worship, there is a way to, uh, to make it appropriate for all generations, to involve all generations and to give them part in creating the worship activities. And now it's your turn. So we're going to give each group one aspect of the church service and ask you to think of 10 ways you could involve children and teens um, in this activity. <clears throat> so that could be welcome, songs, prayers, sermon, offering, scripture. So we're going to put you into breakout rooms now. And we want you to have a scribe who will write down, type up the group's ideas to email uh, to me, and then we can share them with the whole group. They'll be added to the resources uh, later on. So please, will you write them down and share them with us? And try and think of at least 10 ways, more if you can, because once you start to get creative, more ideas will come. <clears throat> 